Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's Prime Time. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I join Sri Jitendra Kumar Oja again, and we are going to talk about something that nobody likes to talk about: the opium that is grown in Afghanistan and its effects, and how it is believed to have uh, allowed the Taliban to survive through the last 20 years. Now there are lots of questions that come up. That uh, you know, why was the U.S. Uh, allowing all this to happen, and and many other angles? What happens to that opium? Is it all smuggled to the West, or is it finding its way to other countries also? All this and more from Sri Jitendra Kumar Oja. Jitendra ji, namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. So once again, Sri ji, for having me on your channel. And uh, thank you, sir. Um, so the the question that I have for you, Jitendra ji, is opium. Yes in Afghanistan. Now, it is believed, I mean, I don't know how true this is, and you can set me straight. It is believed that it is the opium cut that the Taliban was getting through the last 20 years that enabled them to survive through all this. They went into some sort of a hibernation mode, whether you call them being in the Afghan side or in the Pakistan side. Somehow they managed to keep themselves or preserve themselves together, and now they have come back. So can you kind of trace it back to where it all started. What is the impact? I'm also here, here, uh, reading some horrific news that four in 10 youth in Punjab are addicted to uh, drugs. So I don't know if this is the same opium that has found its way into India or not, but perhaps you can give us a good, clear picture of what is happening. Shriji, initially I would say nobody in the entire world would be in a position to give a very clear picture about this thing. Because even UN data is at best estimates, or we say guesstimates, so it is not beyond that. But one thing is clear, I would say, that in 1970s, uh, you know, very credible data says that 70% uh, of the world's opium used to come from Golden Triangle, that is Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand. But today, these have been completely, you know, become irrelevant from 90s onwards, ever since Taliban came, or from 70s itself, this trend started. And at present, you can say that 85% of the total opium cultivation is uh, taking place in Afghanistan. And even uh, this, uh, they say, oven dried uh, opium, the, uh, the total manufacturing or the total production in uh, Afghanistan is assessed to be something like, uh, you can say again, in the range of 85% or so. If you ask me very clear data, UNODC claims, let me tell you that 6,300 tons is produced by Afghanistan estimate on higher side it could be something like 7200 tons and uh, total world production is 7413 tons and on higher side it could be 8200 so you can very well imagine the kind of domination that Afghanistan has acquired and this is not uh, uh, just like uh, an ordinary data because uh, we have discussed on your channel how from 1970s onwards Pakistanis started building a covert capacity, a covert global empire, a covert organized crime empire. And I'm not saying they are the only ones. There would be a lot of people. And that's why I know many of my films who are in international cinema making also, they say better not to speak about this thing because these people are very powerful and they can change governments. They can change things anywhere. But I wouldn't say only opium, but organized crime in certain ways is uh, one area that beyond the point it is very difficult for governments to control or contain them. Regarding Taliban, you have said, uh, Shriji, UNODC data says that, you know, uh, they have been imposing 10% cut, just 10% tax at every stage when it is cultivated, processed, and traded. And in this way, the total revenue of theirs was uh, expected to be something around $400 million uh, 10 years back. But right now, it is assessed anywhere between $1.2 billion to $2.1 billion. So and, uh, a rough estimate is $1.5 billion as per recent reports. But you know, there are a lot of Western journalists. They have gone deep inside uh, Afghanistan. They have uh, you know, carried out filming. They have interviewed people. And on that basis, we can say that this thing is far too rampant. And if you give me a little more time, I will say that, yes, not only Taliban, this place has a large culture of, uh, you know, any like warlords and warlords also needed uh, some source of revenue and opium cultivation you know it gets you 10 to 100 times more profit for even uh, somebody who's growing it 
than if the person cultivates uh, wheat or uh, vegetables or something like this. So it's very lucrative. And another thing is that, you know, why international market has been very receptive to opium grown in uh, Afghanistan, because the quality is three to four times supposed to be better than opium that was grown in uh, Golden Triangle area. Of course, you know, a lot of uh, data is there, a lot of reasons are there why this uh, manufacturing or uh, cultivation of poppy declined in Golden Triangle area. But the demand for this kind of uh, opium and uh, whatever is uh, manufactured out of it, processed out of it, including heroin, etc., and various other drugs is quite high. And besides opium, Afghanis have also started going ephedra and a very well-lit, uh, well-oiled machinery is there. It's not that, you know, local police have not been acting. There are many instances where local police have been acting, but it looks like, you know, some locally influential 10 to 12 dynasties are there, people are there, sometimes name change, but this figure remains same. And these people, in collusion with whosoever is more powerful, they have been growing it. And Pakistanis have a very powerful worldwide network. Once you grow it, it's not sufficient to manufacture it, to process it, to market it, to traffic it. So this is a very combined kind of thing. So no doubt about it that this is a very powerful source of revenue as far as uh, uh, Taliban is concerned. But I would also go on to say, Sriji, that no terrorism, no insurgency anywhere in the world has uh, taken place without this kind of illicit uh, drugs. Drugs have always been a critical factor for fund generation. and. Uh, one of my very esteemed friends, you know, he was a real uh, international counter-terror expert, a retired British police officer. And he told me that how drug and terrorism and Islamic radicalism, at least in Europe, they go hand in hand, they go together. Yes, their patrons, masters, maybe somebody else. But your assessment is absolutely right that opium has been the biggest source of uh, revenue for Taliban. Without this, I don't think they would have been able to survive. Now, um, let us, uh, sit. the situation is a bit strange now. Whatever was a clandestine form of income, now the Taliban will have to either A, regulate it in a better way or try and divert some of that to run the country itself. Because right now, Taliban is facing a near ruin in terms of economy. The Western agencies have completely shut off all the funding. They have frozen the assets of Afghanistan outside. And uh, I believe the ATMs don't have, they've run out of money. Banks are not even open. So there's a real crisis brewing. It can't be more days that they will have to do something about it. So that is one side. Before we go into more depth, I just wanted you to kind of give us a picture of the effect of the various drugs that are right now in proliferating in and around the world. Because of all these global distribution channels, anything grown anywhere finds its way into some of the more lucrative markets such as the United States. There is marijuana that I know of. There is crack that I know of. Then there is opium. Then there is ephedra that you talked about. And then yes. there is this very, very dangerous customer called fentanyl. Yes, fentanyl is there. It can actually, yeah. I mean, this is all that I can think of. And that can actually yes. kill, right? So yes, uh, yes. in terms of like the effect, long-term lasting effects on the human body, which ones are the worst and which ones are a little bit better? And then we can go into more specific details of opium trade. Yes, uh, I would say, you know, better to speak to a medical professional. They would be able to tell it better. I look at uh, drug trafficking and drug this thing purely from security point of view. How is it proliferating? What networks are there? How is it contributing to organized crime? And what is the larger impact on both security and geopolitics? So my area is, uh, you know, uh, limited to that. But there are very large number of drugs. Uh, uh, which you talk about, uh, you spoke about, uh, and uh, cocaine is, you know, very much popular in uh, your part of the world, which is grown locally, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. They have uh, this thing. Mexico is another uh, country which is, uh, which has remained more or less stable. So I would suppose, you know, as various uh, these drugs are concerned, you know, uh, the names are uh, phenomenal. You know, a huge variety has come up within that. Some are synthetic drugs, some are this thing. But majority, you know, even heroin, for example, is grown from poppy only. It is processed from there itself. Yes, uh, ecstasy and a huge number of drugs are there. Uh, I will request you to better consult medical this thing. I, let us focus on how does it impact uh, security and geopolitics. These are my area. But I would say two things, you know, this uh, 
even countries which are cultivating opium even afghanistan or pakistan they have a huge problem and this acts two or three ways they use to destroy others one way of destroying others is of course you know that large percentage of your a good percentage of your young population etc they instead of doing something legitimate you know this kind of clandestine network comes up they get involved they get sucked up in this clandestine network so the that country or society is deprived of that population secondly after some time they become useless some of the drugs are there even in uh, united states i was listening uh, going through some data that uh, 50000 people died because of overdose of uh, uh, these kind of drugs uh, you mentioned so what i'm trying to say that this works in two ways firstly you know it impacts uh, local population affected youth they dry then it has an impact on all economic and other situations it can alter you can say the composition of elite because some people may be there supposed to be doing normal business normal this thing but uh, on the uh, sidelines they would be uh, indulging in something of this nature because over the years the entire uh, mechanism of uh, drug trafficking has attained very high level of sophistication and good amount of money which is generated through this uh, this industry or this thing it gets into legitimate commercial ventures as well and these people all said and done it may take a generation or two for them to transition into full fledged or proper corporate uh, leaders and they can impact manipulate market in various ways but when you talked about human impact human impact is very high punjab you mentioned is uh, one example but even in afghanistan i have uh, seen some videos and some photographs etc that uh, people who are consuming these drugs they are in pathetic condition they are in terrible com- condition methem methem uh, methem fat mean is one drug again synthetic uh, uh, process from uh, ephedra only so this is the one drug which is again uh, afghanis are have grown it uh, far too much uh, there is a huge rise in uh, this kind of drug so what i'm trying to say that the impact is far too much and two or three sides sometimes in punjab it is assessed that you know punjab was uh, one province of india one part of india where people used to be physically strong and very enterprising we always say you will never find a sikh begging on streets isn't it he would be more uh, found doing charity but you see what has happened health of large section of uh, our population in punjab has been impacted so overall impact of whole thing is quite terrible it's a different thing that it gives a different kind of kick to people who are into this trade it gives them a big sense of power they get easy money very lucrative money big money and of course risk is there but the gains are also very high for them so th- these are some of the dynamics that we have to look at it and all stakeholders of the world i would say real corporate leaders real social leaders everybody has to pay attention ignoring is it not a solution uh, shri ji so a uh, couple of things that jump out at me uh, a lot of comments on the uh, show thus far and uh, i I'll, i'll give you what experiences i have uh, in us please, please. many many states in the united states have legalized marijuana now and 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 uh, the effects of that supposed to be a lighter drug marijuana yes, is supposed yes. to be a lighter so, drug so there is a reason behind that the reason why they give that is some uh, you know ailments such as cancer and 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 like you have a lot of pain and morphine kind of helps to dim the pain this person is already suffering from a much worse disease so to to get them to get that uh, get that dosage regularly to kind of alleviate the pain they they take that now that's one side so uh, the, the next question i'm going to ask you is you know united states has in the past if you look at what happened in colombia pablo escobar that's the name of the guy yes, yes. who really made it big in terms of like distribution uh, put narcos on the map I mean, viewers, you can you can watch shows that are available as web series and uh, Netflix and Amazon and so on to understand what the real lives of these people were. So, but what I'm trying to come at is the United States at some point to kind of release pressure, they would go and destroy these crops. Then the Colombian warlords found a new way. They started growing them underneath the subterranean. they would create special buildings and grow it underneath but still the us has been able to put some sort of a lid and control this to some extent i'm not saying fully able to control it yet 
when the United States arrived in Afghanistan in 2001, um, until the time they left in 2021, now I can say US has left, they never touched this opium crop. And it has grown three times now. From 2001 to 2021, the amount of opium that has grown is 3x. Why did the US leave this part alone? In your difficult very difficult question but you know one thing uh, people notice those who are observing u.s actions and u.s decisions that uh, this country works a lot on pressures there are multiple pressure groups multiple lobbies etc they have an impact on how we tax and sometimes three four five entities they say u.s has four mouths or five mouths and each one of them are acting in their own ways so as far as the military is concerned they have been very clear even whatever democracy development or democracy building programs or good governance programs they have been doing that has been very remarkable no confusion about it but this is one area which will keep uh, people surprising and baffling rather why they did not touch this thing because with uh, uh, over the horizon and satellite imagery etc these things were very clear and everybody knew that uh, as long as this opium grows it will add to strength of uh, taliban only and more importantly not only taliban but their mentor or uh, protector pakistan and pakistan's uh, this thing with uh, china is very well known so i think this question must be raised within united states people must ask questions because it has a long term impact marijuana is a very small uh, this thing you know you said very rightly it is always most of these things are as long as these are used in a prescribed medicated way over the counter drugs etc a lot many these legal drugs prescription drugs are available in the united states that is perfectly all right but you know this large scale uh, you know trading in narcotics is something which is dangerous for everyone because it can destroy societies maybe you know in 70s when uh, this thing uh, 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 an oversight committee was brought uh, against intelligence agencies or on intelligence agencies in in United States there were a lot of media reports were there two three things one was you know how they were undertaking internal surveillance at, uh, at one level and uh, secondly they were getting in bringing in cocaine uh, some cocaine uh, networks within United States were being uh, promoted by the, some of their own agencies so we don't know to what extent this is correct or this is true but one thing is clear without patronage of uh, some of the state agencies not uh, directly, but uh, some of their incumbents, etc. This cannot happen. And in certain cases, certain authoritarian countries, I would not like to name, it is assessed that these countries, these powers, they are subverting, you know, the government establishments of some open societies where corruption is rampant to win over, to buy over some of the state functionaries to see that this trade goes on. In Punjab, you know, for example, large number of Punjab police officers, they have been fighting. They, you know, massive camps are organized. Some are, some have taken it up as a, uh, as a mission kind of thing to fight this thing. But within them, these officers have complained that there are some police officers who are popular with every political establishment because they can arrange funding because this clandestine network is very powerful, very influential. So they can get things done. So I suppose even in the United States, there may be people because without a uh, large number of people in influential position being there, this cannot happen, Shriji. And secondly, the consumption of even illicit drugs in the United States, as per UN report, if you see in uh, terms of per capita, it is very, very high. So it's not that, you know, these drugs are uh, not harming them. They are also harming a section of uh, their uh, population. Yes, the total number of uh, these users may be marginally higher in Asia, but if you see population, population-wise, uh, per capita consumption of these drugs is very high there. So what I feel, without some degree of uh, support there in government or state establishment or in uh, opinion makers or uh, certain other sections, civil society, this is simply not possible. So there has to be a larger debate in your part of the world, Sriji. Yes, indeed. And, and this is one of those things that, uh, you know, keeps coming up only during election time and then it goes to the backseat again. Um, but right now, uh, the, the movement is to legalize marijuana. Uh, it is continuing. We have to see where it will stop. But I think a third of the states of the United States have legalized marijuana. But then where do you draw the line, right? Then you legalize meth, you legalize crystal meth. I mean, where do you stop? And, uh, and all along the way, you are making the next generation more vulnerable, even more vulnerable. I mean, these all 
contribute to the decline in society. Now, let's get back to Afghanistan. The opium as a crop is grown in Afghanistan. Then what happens? Can you just walk us through the, the trade, the distribution route that it takes from there? Of course, it is grown part of it. Uh, this is all, as you say, based on interaction with journalists and uh, researchers, which are there in open uh, media and some interaction, of course. Of course, uh, initially, most of it used to be in 90s. Also, it, most of it used to be processed in uh, Pakistan uh, because they used to cross over and there used to be a lot of refineries in Balochistan and there it used to be processed. But over the years, that processing in Pakistan has uh, rather declined substantially. And these are processed partly locally. And then Pakistanis have a worldwide network. And their network extends from far east. You'll be surprised that Pakistanis are in touch with even uh, uh, they're having network in uh, South America, various parts of uh, Africa, uh, various parts of Europe, and of course, within United States also. And then the, there are other networks also, other groups also. So what happens once it is processed, then it is you know, various land routes, air routes, this is given. But, you know, all UN data also, Shriji, is provided by governments or some other agencies. And 100% accuracy is not there. But still, these are more of indicative nature. But what I understand, of course, not uh, too substantially different, that uh, they have created a very well uh, oil network chain of people. And all these people at higher level, these people may not be ordinary people. They may be pretending as big industrialists and they may be having this thing. They may be incurring some losses also in their legitimate business ventures. But this kind of trade, you know, it offsets them. What has happened, you know, over the years, the assessment is that the whole thing has taken far more sophisticated form. You know, distributors, networkers, etc. these are there. And these are being paid locally in some way. You know, and uh, a larger person, maybe a very prominent political person who was suspected in case of Punjab that uh, these kind of influential people with a lot of networks here and there or uh, some commercial people uh, not only here punjab we are given example because punjab is very close to our heart uh, that is why that is why we have to give this example and it, it certainly must be bleeding heart of every indian the way punjab has has been targeted but everywhere these kind of influential people are there within them there are smaller this thing and all over the world these networks are there they sometimes smuggle through land, sometimes smuggle through air also. So, you know, uh, I carried out research some time back. I had carried out that how even Pakistanis were taking their aircraft for maintenance, etc. At one point of time to United States at various airports, they were detained. In certain cases, one case was there where uh, the aircraft was full of uh, these uh, hashish uh, grown in Afghanistan. So, so the, it's not that, you know, it is something which can just anybody can do it. There's a market, some people monopolize it, some people control it, and through that network only it is uh, distributed. So right now, this opium, most of it, it goes to Europe, it goes substantial part of uh, component finds its way to India, and whosoever are even uh, transporters or uh, uh, couriers, even in that area also there's local consumption, but a considerable part of it goes to North America, part goes to Europe, and of course it goes to Africa, and one thing you would notice, wherever there is terrorism, there is some degree of uh, drug use and abuse. In Africa, also, this cultivation has started. And uh, some of the GTI and other researchers, and even I have written a paper uh, in, uh, for fault lines. And you said that how, apart from Afghanistan, Africa is coming up as an alternative hub for breeding terrorism, controlled breeding of terrorism, which bigger powers, which we suspect in, in present case China, they can use terrorism to a certain extent with others. And alongside terrorism, this uh, this thing will also be used because most of these radical groups, you know, what happens? They seem they feel that they are fighting a war. And once you are fighting a war, Shriji, they consider everything as legitimate. So, where you need resources to sustain your cadres, to support your cadres, you are badly in need of uh, quick revenue, quick cash, and this is one thing which can provide you. And at larger level, you know, the volumes are very high, the returns are very high. So it can sustain a good number of people. So that is how most of these people, they act as couriers. And with these networks, it is distributed all over the world. I will tell you one example, not of drug, but of a different uh, subject. You know, I was posted, I told you, was in London. And my job was consular cooperation with uh, British government. So what happened, you know, there was one enforcement uh, wing of uh, UKBA was there. One of my work was also, you know, uh, 
extradition of uh, uh, not extra, extradition repatriation of illegal indian immigrants in uk so i had developed very good rapport with this gentleman and once he invited me the cooperation was going on very well and he invited me to address enforcement officers of uk border agency it was in uk home offices uh, premises only so once i went there these enforcement officers they all started sharing their uh, experience how so many illegal indians and south asians and others this this they have come since i was there they were all mentioning you know the example of indians who had come there and they were living illegally and what all problems were there so when my turn came i told them that look i understand uh, as a government we never uh, approve of this uh, policy that you know indian nationals coming to your country illegally there is absolutely no way we are going to endorse it but you know there are there's a natural problem problem is that you know as a society we have suffered for a long time so there is very i seem to have momentarily lost him we are waiting for him to reconnect let's hope that that happens and viewers today we are talking about the opium grown in afghanistan uh, and we lost for a while <laughs> yes 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 come back please yeah so, so this example i was telling you know that uh, when my you were talking uh, about indian response india as a nation indian response so then i said you know uh, at uk border i said do you think that these people can suddenly jump uh, on their own they can reach on their own even if they are coming from sea there will be someone who is receiving them they they may not be stranger if somebody somehow even by some shape or something if they come and they don't know anyone they will not go undetected for 2 3 years so before you know telling uh, these people that they are guilty you should also look at domestic uh, situation of your own country some of your domestic institutions at some level they may be compromised some networks are already working in this area and these people who are coming you know they are expecting a fortune most of them what kind of life they are leading most of them were working on daily wages and i i had rescued some of these people they were barely getting something to survive and some of them had sold their land sold their houses in hope of in hope of a better future and this is what they were getting i said that these people should be treated as victims and you should look at you know your domestic uh, institutions some of which may be compromised or some uh, some you know some of these human trafficking networks which may be flourishing and they are exploiting these people and these people are you know virtually for all practical purposes these people are being exploited you know after this their language changed they started saying yes there was a humanitarian aspect these people were barely getting you know 50 pounds for a week which is uh, much lower they had to work for a wage is much lower than the normal wages so what i'm trying to say we are talking about yes opium is grown everything is fine but there has to be a market without market you know without market and without local support structure in those countries this cannot go on and this local support structure is very much there in europe very much there in uh, north america and it is very much there in india because without some degree of patronage from certain political quarters some police quarters some others this just can't happen and anyone who speaks up stands up against these networks that person is simply knocked out obliterated and uh, anything can happen because nowhere law enforcement has reached a level where they can tackle something of this nature shrieky so this is how it works this is how it operates i would say Thank so you. um let, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, pakistan for example today what is pakistan's economy uh, one time another panelist had mentioned that pakistan's economy right now is so bad that they consume what they produce by way of food etc etc they were doing some decent job like for example cement and even that india dropped the most uh, whatever the status most preferred nation most preferred nation status no, mfn and, most preferred nation yeah most mfn that status has been dropped so now i don't know where they are exporting cement uh, but looks like drugs have become part of their underground economy because these things will never surface and i have heard rumors that their biggest private bank habib bank has already been uh, flagged as a money launderer and therefore there are Long lots of that. scrutiny lot of scrutiny on what money moves through that so today i'm talking today how is the mo money moving out of the pakistani system once somebody got paid on this what is happening to that money how is it finding tax haven because i'm assuming 
at some point it's going to reach tax havens. Is it a digital currency transaction like a Bitcoin that is being used to do this thing or what are your thoughts? You know, Nadikar, um, Habib Bank is a very old news. It was uh, flagged earlier itself for money laundering and it has yes, yes. been suspected. And regarding this thing, you know, uh, this UN report itself says that online through dark web, the sale of uh, these narcotics is something around 350 to 400 million dollars. This is what it was. One one component, small component. So Bitcoin, etc. is also certainly involved in it. Uh, but another thing, you know, some people who have been studying and uh, deeply getting into it, so they have said that, you know, it's possible that some larger businesses, they are taking some money from these, these things, uh, taking it as a legitimate commercial transaction, whereas that transaction may not be there. There was uh, one case, you know, that uh, some uh, some so-called exporter, I will give you from India, so some, some uh, so-called exporter was... Uh, uh, you know, exporting oil or something, and it wasn't really oil. It was just, uh, you know, uh, some uh, unnecessary canes and some uh, things like this, empty. And in return, he was getting paid uh, this thing. So it sounds as a normal legitimate export, and what you are getting is a kind of laundered money from some, one of the tax haven, uh, DVI or uh, Isle of Man or uh, these kind of New Jersey from uh, companies registered over there. So this regulation is very difficult. So some day, when you know where it is going to come up, uh, this cash kind of thing has almost uh, stopped uh, anywhere and everywhere. And uh, this is most worrying because uh, some uh, legitimate normal commercial entities who seem to be doing normal commercial activities and they're genuinely doing these commercial activities, they are taking money through by layering it from two, three, four, or sometimes 25, 27, 40, the same levels of layering are there. And from there, they're getting this money. And then the money gets into the system uh, this way. So it is very difficult, you know, unless and until there's a larger. This is why we say, you know, the democracy has to rediscover itself because authoritarian and other system, they will continue to grow. Some people will continue to remain powerful. But unless and until there's a serious re-engineering, not through existing laws, etc. Laws itself have to be totally, you know, uh, made in tune with such a thing that, you know, this uh, space for something like this is completely eliminated unless something of that nature happens, this will keep on happening. I will say, Sriji, you know, man was a cannibal at one point of time, but within that, some people took initiative and there was society and there was development and there has been progress. But those instincts of two, these contradictory instincts of human beings, they simultaneously, they keep on growing. So Pakistan, we very often talk about Pakistan, unfortunately, uh, it is hardly a state. You know, we try to see Pakistan from our Indian perspective. And many Indian Muslims, uh, friends of mine, unfortunately, they think, you know, without having any idea that Pakistan is also like India, there are a lot of good people there. I'm not denying that people, good people are there. But the whole Pakistani state apparatus is such that a small number of people, a small caucus in Pakistan, Shiji, is controlling a territory. It has an armed force of its own. It is least bothered about people. Somehow people have to be fed. Somehow things have to be kept at a manageable level. Small number of people are working also, but real people who are controlling Pakistan, they are very wealthy people through this kind of drug and organized crime is the source of revenue. They have set up a brilliant network or a very powerful network all over the world. So they will individually continue to flourish. And some of them, after you know getting money from this, as I said, this money gets laundered and comes into normal commercial activity also. And it is difficult to detect. You can't detect it's just not possible and beyond a point you know it's a counterproductive exercise you're wasting a lot of time and energy and returns will be negligible but fact is that you know that pakistan is a very unique kind of uh, state and some people who are controlling it they are still having that cannibalistic instinct in a more refined form you can say that even if pakistanis are dying it's fine if more indians are dying they are happier if they are able to inflict damage in the west still they will be content they'll be happy they will keep on practicing takaya, keep on practicing speaking good English and keep on impressing Britishers and uh, Americans. And, you know, the whole world, even over there, you know, the, this level of insensitivity is there. So, but uh, I don't think that anyone who's studying this area, observing, I'm not a specialist in this area. My area is much larger. My area is much larger than bigger focus I have. But I'm sure those who are specialists, they know the whole detailed this thing. Mechanics is very well known. But why states are not able to muster courage? This is uh, this is uh, also not very surprising, as they say that they can bring down government almost anywhere in any democratic dispensation. 
So that is why people are not talking about it, as you said initially. Yes, indeed. And uh, I was just looking at some questions coming across. Uh, one or two have not been covered by us in this uh, conversation today. And uh, can we have questions, please? There's one question I saw. Uh, put the comments back. I saw quite a few questions uh, by a few people. Yeah. So here, here is one thing from Abhinav Singh. I think we're done with the original part. I think le let me just finish what we were talking to summarize it. In this particular thing, our opium business, all are guilty. It's not just one country. After all, Afghanistan is just producing it. And uh, the consumer, the person who's enabling this, they're all guilty. And like uh, Jitendra Ji said, the four or five departments of the United States that are involved in this, and not everybody has the same kind of motive in mind. We are not taking any, we're not pointing fingers at any one particular individual organization, but that is where the problem lies. And uh, that needs to be addressed by the Congress and the Senate in the United States. Let's hope even that in India. Even and, and in even India. India too. Yes, yes. A anywhere. Open societies have to acknowledge that they cannot allow their population to be destroyed by this. Please read it. Absolutely. And then let's just go to questions. I have one last thing, but we'll do, we'll do it later uh, if we have time. Uh, Abhinav Singh wants to know what's happening in Taliban. Uh, can you go back to the previous question, please? Abhinav Singh wants to know what's happening in Taliban is very much visible. And even a common man is feeling really bad on the degree of human rights violation. Can we expect the United Nations to do something? Abhinav, part of the answer for this will be on today's DGI, episode 237. Do watch it. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, Taliban has managed to intimidate local population, Shriji, and uh, uh, that is how they have come to this position. What has happened over the last few decades, I would say, that so-called warlords, even before Taliban came to power, ever since American intervention started during Soviet era, by the way, drugs were not that much of a problem from 79 to 89. So that time, drugs were hardly a problem. The, this thing was uh, much lesser in 70s. The Golden Triangle was uh, producing far more. This thing, 70% it contributed to total this thing, and 30% was for this region and. Uh, you can say Mexico and that uh, Peru and Colombia, all these regions combined. So it started from 1980s onwards when this so-called jihad and religious uh, thing started uh, happening. So these warlords, you know, they needed to keep an army. And then once they needed to keep an army, they needed a lot of cash. And this area, for some reason, you know, say you say the soil is far more fertile. The quality of opium which is grown here is uh, three to four times of a more superior quality than what is available anywhere else. And from here, it whole thing started. And, you know, everybody was dependent on these warlords. So when Taliban came, people said those they destroyed certain opium fields. Yes, uh, one or two, they may have done it because it may have belonged to some adversaries or something like this. But Taliban's, uh, this thing, flirtations with opium is there from 1995, 96, ever since almost they came. From that point of time, it was there. In 2001, this took a hit when American intervention took place. But from 2002, it again started increasing. 2016-17 in re reached a very high level. So fact is that, you know, that these invisible groups, these invisible uh, so-called dynasties and warlords who have a lot of people at their disposal, because people who are working for them, they cannot revolt. Like uh, one of the reasons they accepted Hamid uh, Karzai, because he did not have an army of him himself. Even so was the case with Ashraf Ghani. These people did not have an army of their own, a mili private militia of their own. So fact is that, you know, all these warlords, militias and so-called uh, big men over here, they have been having people at their disposal who are doing these dirty things. And Pakistanis, they have a kind of very well laid out grid. In that grid, the whole thing goes. And there are, you know, people who are passive approvers or some clandestine active uh, collaborators in this thing. As I said that even in Punjab, you know, sometime few days back, there's a media report that uh, this much of consignment has been caught. And Pakistanis many a times are not doing it themselves. They have a very powerful network even in Africa. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> Nigerians or Kenyans and other distinct African nationals, Ugandans, all these people, they are able to recruit. And through these kind of things, they're able to pump in the whole thing. So I believe, you know, that instead of targeting, uh, targeting at one level, this targeting has to be there at multiple levels. Unfortunately, 
I don't think United States, uh, United Nations is equipped to handle something of this nature because United Nations is a body where these countries are involved. I believe that local level, there is a lot of resentment. And even in Afghanistan, average Afghanis, he doesn't want to do it. Let us uh, be uh, certain of one thing, irrespective of everything, there's always a section of good people who want to lead their normal life. Of course, none of them are perfect. It's only a small number of people through means like these, they try to control the rest. And somehow Pakistan is the biggest problem, which not because I'm an Indian, that is why, you know, the West has a tendency when we say this thing, they, they, they find it very difficult to believe. But this kind of shady underhand activities, uh, they, they keep on doing and they keep on denying also. And uh, somehow West had encouraged them. It was largely under Western encouragement and patronage and support that uh, Pakistan has managed to grow in this way. So I, I don't think UN is in a position to do it. But yes, all democratic countries, all right minded countries, they have to do it. China had a massive problem at one point of time, you know. So all said and done, they have tried to protect their own population. And from 50s, 60s, people say one of the reasons this uh, drug cultivation, this has come down in. Uh, Southeast Asia because of Chinese intervention and Chinese uh, consumption of uh, this thing in Chinese uh, mainland has substantially declined because of strict regulation. So once we are talking about a better world, more integrated world, I suppose that despite all differences, everybody has to work together. That fine, you have issues, you fight, but not this way because the consequences of this is very dangerous. But you know, some of these uh, elements like Pakistan I'm talking about or others who are talking about, they feel that, you know, by pumping in drug in uh, your country, and especially I would say about my country, they are destroying us by two ways. We are, they are raising money from us at one level, and they're destroying the quality of population. So in this larger, you know, jihad and gajwai hin, this is a very potent way. This is also another weapon which, which is being used. And I think that those who are adversaries of India, they will also be very happy. And the system is such because of corruption or otherwise, you can say, that people who are promoting it, they feel that rest of the people are also corrupt. So why should they be targeted? I'm sure they, 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 it's difficult to target them. It is difficult to identify them. But this is what is likely to be their rationale for, you know, collusion in this kind of thing, which has such a dangerous impact on society, Shriji. Thank you so much, sir. And the next question is from Mandar Karnik. Is there any way for global community to keep Pakistan out of FATF safe list? Or will they eventually come out? You see, in the 2019 report of FATF, uh, Pakistan's compliance was there uh, only on one this thing. And most of these, they had, yeah. yes, then later on, they, they came on others, 2020. And there were a large number of countries and there was uh, this instances of violation were far too many. And none of those countries, including European countries, including France, including others, they did not speak against Pakistan. So Pakistan is one thing. This is what, you know, surprises me. And that why a country like this, despite doing all the dirty things, is able to convince, persuade, influence, or I don't know if intimidate others, uh, uh, some functionaries of democratic countries, they are not able to speak. So I don't know. I don't think in a foreseeable future, FATF is going to blacklist Pakistan because Pakistan has done far more than, than uh, normal to be blacklisted. But it looks very difficult for me. Yes, indeed. And I think that's the end of our questions for today. I just want to leave you with one parting thought. Um, the uh, FATF, they have some permanent members who are always going to side with Pakistan. So I don't think they'll ever be blacklisted. They'll be always in gray list. And they'll make this shadow dressing of saying, window dressing of saying that, oh, we took care of it. And then therefore, now we are in a better place than before. So the root cause of all this is the original thing, which is the opium. And and two ways to go. Organized crime. Not organized only opium. Crime. Yeah. In opium is one part. What has, I'm sorry to interview. Once you build a network of something like this, counterfeiting also comes in. So they are also champion of counterfeiting. So the same extortion, protection and laundering of dirty money. You know, the Pakistanis are, I'm not saying because I'm Indian. Britishers are saying that Pakistanis are printing uh, British uh, currency. Americans are saying that, that American dollars are being printed at Pakistan and others. Uh, Pakistan is not the only this thing. Uh, maybe some bigger patron of Pakistan is also involved in printing of American currency. So <laughs> big time, are, big time. Yes. Through all their sister states. <laughs> yes, so all these things. So this is a different kind of, even if physical wars don't take place, 
but these elements are there mercenaries are there who keep on flourishing but pakistani elite a very small number of them they have managed to perfect this kind of system to uh, you can say uh, uh, create a kind of big uh, conglomerate of uh, all shades of crime where they are deeply involved and everybody needs their services so that is why you know this uh, fatf for apg uh, is not able to come out with stiff action against them yes indeed and thank you very much jitendra ji for uh, that uh, erudite discussion that we had on opium uh, this is not going away anytime soon however we should also remember that by infecting the uh, the punjabi uh, population uh, at least in the 80s up until maybe late 80s or early 90s the indian uh, army armed forces was having a significant percentage of sikhs you have generational sikhs who have been in air force army navy what have you and and it was directed at that this is also one of the thousand cuts that zia ul haq had uh, started out with and it continues to this day let's hope that you know um, this is addressed on a war footing lots of problems that's all i see problem 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 it's our hope that by showcasing some of the places where this can be fixed that at least the governments uh, whether it is the united states or the indian government uh, can at least effect some positive changes to bring about a better quality of life thank you thanks for joining and do watch subscribe and like our channels namaskar <clears throat>